Welcome to the FBI Coach Education Webinar. I'm Gareth Marr and I'm delighted to be joined by Republic of Ireland Under-19 head, co head Coach and FA Coach Educator Tom Moan. Tom, thanks for joining us. Hi Gareth, how are you? Good, yeah. Um, Tom, we're going to be discussing um, team meetings today, pre, pre post training and games. And uh, before we get into it, I'd like to kind of just discuss a couple of things about um, your own kind of steps into coaching as well. But uh, for anybody watching this webinar, Tom will set an assignment at the end. So stay tuned for that because you can earn up to three hours CPD. And uh, we'll also have a competition supported by Umbro Ireland as well. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, Tom, when you were a player in the League of Ireland, um, when when did you first start thinking that you might pursue coaching? Yeah, Gareth, probably when I was uh, at Derry City, I, I would have done uh, my first coaching course when I was at Derry. And uh, obviously, um, from there, like, you know, I would have done some coaching at clubs, you know, and things like that, and, and, and camps and that. Like, so it would have been an introductory course at the time. And uh, then when I moved from Derry on to Finn Harps, doing a level one course. And uh, when I was at Harps, I got the job uh, as a development officer with the FEI. And from there, continued on in my coach education through the B licence the the A license and, and then the pro license, you know. So uh, along that journey, obviously at Derry and Harps, a lot of, you know, really good quality players. Sometimes you're you've been coached really well on the pitch too. Like, you know, when as a young player the likes of you Paul Doolan and Paul Haggerty and Liam Coyle, Johnny Speak, like the fellas have got there giving you information and you're it's it's adding to your knowledge as well. And even prior to that, like you know, I was very fortunate to have um been a young player under Sean McCarthy, the club in Monon called Oriel Celtic, and in the early 90s, Sean was doing video analysis with us, and we were preparing for tournaments uh, on the continent, and he had us in as, as a group of players, he video games beforehand, and bring us in prior to training, watch them, and then go out onto the training pitch and uh, replicate uh, what he wanted us to do. You had a lot of uh, good experiences around you then, good, good mentors. How commonplace were team meetings when you were a player? Yeah, at some occasions we would have had, you know, team meetings at, at various stages, you know, um, there, there would have been at times during the season, uh, there would have been, but obviously not to the detail they are at the moment, or you don't have the technology that you have, you know, at the moment, uh, but there would have been, there would have been some, some managers would have, would have differed, like, you know, uh, so, but it was all, there was, you know, at team meetings then, like, you know, you were, you, you were hungry for information as a player and you wanted to learn and, there were, were good experiences too at that time. Uh, as you progressed in your coaching career, you know, going up the ladder, you obviously a development officer as well at the same time. So um, you have that kind of sense of control of, you know, people listening to you when you're in the room and that. So team meetings must become prevalent and more important quite quickly for you. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, when you really get into the coaching yourself and you see the importance of, of the team meetings and, and obviously, you know, there's a balance as well. Like, you know, how many team meetings do you have? You know, how long are your team meetings? What's the information you're providing for your players and the specific units and individuals that you're working with? Like, you know, and through time, you know, uh, you're always looking at improvement goals within within your own team meetings. Like, you know, and probably when I got into coaching first and into management first, my team meetings now would be much different to what they were then. Uh, and it's it's obviously being open and, and listening to other people and we've a great uh, connection with all our underage international managers and there's a strong link there with our coach education as well that uh, we, we would share a lot of information too you know and mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of very very good coaches around the country as well and you, you're constantly getting wee nuggets of, of information along the way. Tom as a player uh, with regards to team meetings do you think there was anything in particular that might have helped your performance that you got from a meeting in particular? Yeah, Gareth, actually, uh, we were going to play a playoff, uh, first leg semi final against Bray, and uh, it was up in Bray, and they had a strong side at this time. Like, you know, and, uh, it, was, it was a big pressure game, like, you know, and I remember Noel King was the manager at the time, and uh, we're, we're driving from the hotel to the ground, like, you know, but we knew we've left the hotel probably a bit early, like, but Noel had a method in this madness, like, you know, so he just takes us to this, like, a a forest walk, right lads, out of the bus, just everybody go for a walk. So we're just going for a 10 minute walk, but Kinger's nearly going around every individual player, like, you know, with a, just a wee nugget of information or a wee thing about the game or maybe, you know, to relax you. And we went out onto the pitch and it's probably one of the 
best performances I ever put on. I mean, he was a player, like you know. But it's it's it, it was a it was an interesting one. It's one that you know you never forget, like you know. So uh, and things like that, maybe even changing the set and doing something different, it can you know take players' minds off of pressure situations. So come here, it was a it was a school day for me, a learning one. <laughs> Great stuff. Let's let's kind of start with the kind of structure that you would go through. I suppose the first one would it be a pre-training meeting, or would it be a staff meeting that you would start with? I will obviously, you know, when you meet up and you, you know your staff meetings are are so so important too because um, they're probably the first meeting that you'll have, you know, to roles and responsibilities for your staff, and um, even within their team meetings, you know. It's it's the timing of your team meetings also, like because if players have got physio prior to a, a team meeting, you've got to allow your physio time uh, to come back to you with information on the availability of players, the fitness of players. Uh, so things like that there are are very very important, like you know, and as I say, the the timing and the structure of your meetings. Obviously, the we would have a group meeting also at the end of every day for the staff. It would you know also. If they have any points to make to the players, uh, they've that freedom as well. It could be uh, our kit man John Crudden. It could be what the players are wearing the next day, like you know, and uh, if all gears coming back and keeping on top of things like that. So uh, that whole group setting that is so so important, basically, as your uh, your opportunity of information for everybody interacting together within the group. Uh, in the football terms, uh, the pre-training team meeting uh, is of vital importance because. You don't have that many training sessions with the players because generally we meet on a Saturday. Uh, the players will have played Friday night or Saturday. So Sunday morning then it's a recovery session for the vast majority of the players. And then Monday is your main session going into your game on Wednesday. So that's match day minus two. And uh, that's a very, very important day of that one. But regarding our pre-training team meetings, it's basically you're looking at, you got to bring the opposition into context here too and our video analyst uh, getting all the clips together, the technical staff meeting prior to that, uh, and then putting the clips together uh, and the, the structure we would use, we would look at the opponents, we would look example on their build-up, maybe from goal kicks, uh, what their setup is. Uh, we would show that to the players, we would show visuals of that to the players, we would look at the strengths and weaknesses on that build-up, uh, and then we would look at clips of, our, of ourselves, our own team, uh, defending against the goal kick, uh, and continually show positive clips of our players so to get it into their minds how well they can do it and to, to prepare them for the session as best we possibly can. Obviously within that there's animations, there's use of tactic board. That meeting generally takes probably max 15 minutes like you know and we, we detail the structure of the meeting of the session for the players also prior to going out onto the pitch. You mentioned uh, Tom the positivity there of you know being relaying positive messages in the team meeting when when do you do not negative but maybe more constructive kind of feedback with players? Would that be in a much more one on one meeting or a unit meeting then? Actually, post training, uh, then the players we would obviously come back in. Players change. We get lunch and then uh, we would have a meeting then in the afternoon. You know, just to to review uh, the session that morning, and that is basically player led. Uh, they get ownership of that session. Example: If we're working on the on the front three players and our number ten, uh, I would set scenarios on the tactic board, and I would allow the players then to to go and come up with solutions to those scenarios, which would all be in re relation to the training. And you start to identify players that have, you know, probably got picked up greater knowledge from the session, uh, or shown leadership. Uh, and, and sometimes there will be players will be more comfortable standing in front of the group and other players might come up and just work on the tactic board, you know, but it's important for them to, to relay the message to the other players. And then the next session, it could be midfield players could go up and, and present. And that gives a uh, staff and myself a great understanding of you know, the, the players, the, the knowledge that they have and leadership as well. So you, and it instills you with confidence too, like to know we'll hear, these guys are taking on board this information and I'm confident I start these lads, you know, they're, they've got the capabilities, they've got the knowledge to to impart this on the pitch. Can, can I rewind a little bit, uh, Tom, just the, the experience that you've gained from through the years of team meetings and how to approach them. 
I suppose the setup of a meeting is a, it's an important point for all coaches to take on board, isn't it? In terms of, you know, when the players walk through the door of that room, that everything is in place, your tactics board, your, you know, um, your record, your recorder, the equipment, you know, if it's a hot room, you have a fan or whatever these types of things are, is, you know, you have Wi-Fi connection, all these kind of little bits kind of add up to make sure it runs seamlessly. Yeah, Gareth, you know, even even the seating, you know, uh, how how you position the seats, like you know, so every player's got a view, uh, the the lighting, um, the 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 staff, the positioning of the staff as well, like you know, I, I'm very fortunate, of, you know, really really good staff, like you know, if, you know, if we go back to the finals, Mickey Feeney um, and Martin Doyle were were analysts, like you know, um, Mick Neville is the coach, Colin Haley's the coach. Um, Dermot Neal's a goalkeeping coach so I would also make sure that the staff, you know, interact in the meetings but they're in positions where they can see, they can come in and out with information but also uh, they can feed you back with some great information on players too like you know, when, you know, he's tuned in he's gone after five minutes, you know and through mm-hmm. no fault of the players, some players just maybe not have, you know the, you know, a long concentration span or whatever and you got to identify those players and maybe in your individual meetings Provide them with more more information, and uh, and that's it. Like you know, one size doesn't fit all. Like you know, because you do a meeting for the group, 50, 60 percent can maybe take it on board. Another forty percent is we've got to have a different way of learning for them. Maybe actually doing is their best way of learning. Um, individual meetings, getting feedback from those players, uh, providing the tactical information to the players in individual meetings, uh, and that can often be the case. Like you know. How how do you how do you react in a situation like that, Tom? If you do have a you know young player who is struggling to pay attention, or he might be disruptive in the meeting or something like that. I suppose you know many years ago, a, a teacher in a classroom might might have chucked a bit of chalk at the at the fella to wake him up, like you know. But I suppose you can't do that any any anymore. Like, nah. <laughs> can't go down that road, Gareth. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, Sometimes, you know, you, you'll have a word with the player, like, you know, you'll, you'll take the player to the side and you'll have a word with them, like, you know, and, and, and make them aware of, you know, you can't be disruptive, like, you know, you can't mess with your teammates' careers, like, you know, and the importance of playing for your country. And, and it doesn't matter, you know, whether it's club, country or whatever, like, you know, attitude discipline is so, so important, like, you know, and players have got to be, they've got to be open, they've got to be prepared to have to go to team meetings and some players just don't like being there you know they're not comfortable there and you've got to, and that's why probably one of the big learnings for myself was try and you know reduce the the length of them like you know um and probably the longest team meetings we would have would be review meetings where players would obviously uh, we would give them tasks where the areas we would have covered in training, like, you know, example, the four functions of the game, attack and transition to defend, defend and transition to attack, and under set pieces, we would split them into groups. So then they would present uh, to the rest of the group the information and the, from training and everything that we would have done prior to maybe going into our first game. And uh, those, those meetings would probably be the longest because, but there's interaction. And the players are involved, and there's a you know there's good camaraderie in the in the group, and you know it's part of the setting the dynamic for the group as well, and it's 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 a good another good opportunity for for players to learn within that group setting. And sometimes you get a feel for a meeting, and you just say here, like, this is really really good. This is you know there's a good interaction with the group. There's a real enthusiasm here, like you know, and you can stretch that meetings on, like you know, and sometimes you may just have to cut a meeting short, like and just say bang, that's enough, boys. Can see you're tired, or whatever it is. We, we'll cover, we, we'll tidy up this later on. Or you could split a meeting, you know, say, wait, we'll do 10 minutes, 15 minutes now, go and do another 15 minutes later on instead of having a half hour, 40 minute meeting. For, for a coach that might have a smaller group of players to work with, would you recommend shorter meetings? Yeah, look, like, uh, a smaller group as such, is that a, a unit yeah. you're talking about, Gareth? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe not a squad of 20 players and might only have maybe 12 players or more, more, even coaches at grassroots level that are dealing with, you know, uh, smaller groups of players. Uh, yeah, like, you know, you, you probably, when you've less players, you can, you can probably, I suppose, work in more detail with specific units within that. But still, the most important thing is the message that you want to get across. You know, if you have a message to get across and get it clear, concise, and with conviction, 
that's that's the key. And uh, we would set our meeting rooms up also that there would be a unit. Say the first row of seats would be goalkeeper and defenders. Next row would be midfield players. Next row would be attackers, or it could be left, right, centre. Like you know. So when I'm speaking to a specific unit, that uh, I know where they're positioned and I know who to make the contact with. Like you know. And obviously, working on units. Uh, I find if you isolate units, maybe you're just working with an attacking group coming in, you know that maybe the midfield players are missing out on that. You're working with midfield players, the defenders are missing out. So my own experience from example, units meetings would be bring the group together and, and put them into the units so they're still getting the information from the whole team in general. Like and that's part of our, you know, like coach education too, like you know, that team you know, everything based around the team, whether it's out on the pitch or it's in the meeting rooms, that, that information, shape of the team, and then you can you can break that down then into the specific unit you're working with and then obviously target your individuals within that unit. Do you, do you encourage the players to give you feedback in the team meetings as much as during or or after a session, the training session? Absolutely. It's, it's open, like, you know, everything's just, you know, open at any stage, like, you know, when it's not a case of, Wait and finish this meeting, and you can ask questions. Like questions can take place right throughout the meeting at any time. A player has a specific question, and they want to query something. There's no doubt about it. And you know, I think it's very, very important that that players are given that freedom to do that. And not all players will like doing that. Like you know, and sometimes you will have to go back to your individual meetings to to allow that, or maybe just walk into the training ground, walking back from the training ground, around the hotel. You know open at any stage players want to say, you know, question anything. It's at any given time, as long as their mind is clear on the role that they have to carry out. And like the big thing too is like, you know, we can't just, you know, we've got to be careful that we're not providing too much information or we're not mind boggling with stuff. Players are given the freedom to go and express themselves. But you have to, you know, you have to have a structure within the four functions of the game and obviously your organization at set basis. But uh, with all our underage international teams, that, that's the way, like, there's good structure to our meetings. Um, players are given freedom to go and express themselves. And, um, no, it's, it's, come here, it's about combining both and gelling both together, getting that balance right again. Is there, is there a balance there to strike between inviting feedback and, you know, um, taking that feedback on board from the players, but also you will want your own way of approaching a training session or a game and the player might disagree. Like, is there a balance there of a, of a player going too far with their opinions and their feedback? Yeah, there. You know, it's, it's once again striking that right note. But obviously, with a uh, technical staff, analysts, myself, you know, we could, we put so many hours into you know analysing the opposition and identifying their strengths, their weaknesses, maybe opportunities where we can we can exploit their weaknesses that. You know, I think if we've done our homework right, you know, that I get this message across, and we're clear in our minds, and we've gained enough knowledge on the opposition, you know, prior to going to play them, going into our training sessions, um, like, that's, the, the players then will feed off that, like, you know, because if they know that you are you have shown this knowledge, the work's been put in, and they will question certain situations, and probably one of the worst things you can do as a manager is, uh, ask a player to do something they're not comfortable at doing, like you know, or they're not confident to do. And I think that's one of the great things. And that's where players might, you know, come and question you, and you might sense a wee bit of worry within a player, like you know. So you you have to reassure them on that foot too. And the other thing too is like, I think half time is the big one. You, you know, you, you got to really listen to players because we're on the outside looking in at the action. They're in the heat of the battle. They're seeing, seeing probably different situations than we may be seeing as much as we cover the game. And I would have Dermot O'Neill in the stand as the goalkeeping coach, obviously, uh, watching our keeper, but also looking at how we are in transition to defend when we're attacking, how well we're set up behind the play. The Colin Healy's role, Colin has an overall view of the game and, and looking at, you know, maybe areas where we can exploit opponents and maybe real strengths where they are causing us problem and there's communication to the bench there and obviously you've met with myself as well overseeing things like you know but as much as we know and as much as we've been through we've got to be aware that the players are in the heat of the battle they are under pressure they're the ones making the decisions there's things happening in and around and we must be very open to their feedback 
you know, and if there's problems that they're encountering on the pitch, it's then our role as, as technical staff to to provide accurate information back to those players, like, you know, to, to help them to solve the problem. That's, a, that's an interesting way of looking at it, Tom, because <clears throat> when you say team meetings, people will probably have an image in their mind of, you know, a hotel room or, or something like that. But a team meeting can be a pretty much uh, team talk or it can be a half-time discussion or a half-time, uh, you know, feedback session, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so many team meetings, like, right, from you from you meet the group of players between, as I say, staff meetings, uh, pre-training, post-training, uh, review meetings, individual meetings. There's so many, like, you know, and um, it's a constant. And obviously, that's pre-match, you know, how you get your message across pre-match. Because the last thing players want, for anyone to is, is an overload of information that they've got to have headspace, they've got to be allowed to go and you know focus their own minds on the on the job in hand, like, and you've got to be careful with that. And, um, and once again, one size doesn't fit all. Like you know, maybe you, you could be prior to going out on the pitch, you know, you're you could be that period where you're going to motivate them, but you got to be careful. You could overdo that as well, like you know, and you've got to have a feel for the group of players that you're dealing with, and that can often be like we talk about forming to to form a group. There'll be the storming period where, you know, the settling in period, you know, there's a, a normalizing of a group and trying to get that context, you know, all together, like and right. And it's getting that feel from a particular group. And um I actually felt with this group of players that we had this year, maybe I would have felt that we they may have been under pressure to go and replicate what the group done last year. And I had to be mindful of that and maybe take that pressure off a bit like you're a different group you've different players and you need time to get to, to know groups but thankfully you know within the association and within the international, international department we all work very closely as international managers right through and there's you know a brilliant program Niall Harrison's run over the last number of years you know where we get our elite national group of emerging talent players together and they come in at various stages throughout the season and they uh, Niall is brilliant coaches working with them lads. And even as young as them lads, 12, 13, 14 years of age, you know, they're getting great information. They have team meetings. And look, I'd be linking in even with Niall at that age group. And they, it's just the knowledge of these players that they come in with and, you know, the questions they ask. And that's very refreshing, like, you know, to know because you need to be an intelligent player to play the game at a high level now, like, you know, with all the tactics and everything that's out there. Um, right through Jason, Paul, Colin, Andy, uh, we sat right through the ages up to, to Jim now at 21, Stephen at, at senior level. Like there's, a, there's a strong connection there, you know, that, you know, Rudis formed through the through our high performance department. And each and every, well, the vast majority of us are involved in coach education. So that's a big part of our learning too. Like, you know, that we're, we're delivering coaching courses, we're doing presentations. Uh, uh, Niall O'Regan's getting us to go to, to various events throughout Europe um, through UEFA study groups. We're bringing in guest speakers from Europe. Uh, indeed, you learn from the many participants on our courses, like, you know, through pro license, elite youth, the AA license, fellows with great experience. So I think that's very, very important, that, that shared information and listening to other people's experiences is really, really important. That's a really interesting um, point, Tom, because uh, Paulo Zam in one of our webinars kind of made that point about young players that you can see them as future coaches. And you've even mentioned it there in the team meetings that, you know, you empower them to kind of take control of the sessions sometimes to give their feedback, you know, using the tactics board and getting involved. So even though, even if they don't know it, they're actually taking on a lot of the core competencies of coaching at a, a while still playing. And I suppose... Even if you look at another sport, um, like American football, for example, all the players are given a playbook and they're told to learn a playbook and go in. I know it's a very structured and regimented kind of sport compared to football is more fluid, but it, it's still kind of empowering the player to kind of say, OK, you need to know this stuff, you know, to understand the game in a, in a, in a far broader sense. Yeah, absolutely. And we would do that probably mostly with set pieces, like, you know, we would, we would WhatsApp the set pieces out to the players, uh, the players in their, you know, in their downtime in the games room or what, we would leave iPads there, like, you know, that we would have everything put put together there on, you know, iPads. If the players just wanted casually to go in and look at, you know, the different functions, the roles, the opposition, that 
some some visuals through video as well. They're available to them there. So that's another learning tool for them. Like you know that in their own time, go in and look at you know for maybe a team meeting making work or an individual meeting making work. It's just go individual yourself, have a look in your own free time. And they have access to the huddle uh, uh, performance analysis tool as well. Yeah, we have access to Huddle, and the players are, you know, the, the players are linked up to Huddle too. So videos of, the, of games are sent to them. Uh, different aspects of the, the game are sent to the opposition. So they have also freedom to go on and look at that as well. Like you know, as, a, as another as another very uh, useful tool. You mentioned um, the, the manager meetings there um, that yourself and the other international managers have. Can you can you talk a little bit about that in terms of? Obviously, at the moment, I assume everything is on video call with what's happening at the moment. Uh, while we speak now in May 2020, but it's um it's it's an interesting concept of that all of the managers are coming together to share ideas and experiences. Yeah, every week you know we we meet up and uh, we're given analysis tasks to do every week. So we're we're still you know we're kept going. We're we're exploring different situations. We're looking at different countries. Uh, so we're using this time uh, effectively to for learning for ourselves, like you know, whether it's the various aspects of the game and seeing something that we can bring back to the table. And as again, as I say, there are so many you know experienced fellas that I'm working with in the in the international department, and um, it, it's very very important that you know we continue that link and that we keep ourselves open to learning and to improving the game in Ireland, and that we get those messages relayed out again to to. All our coaches. Tom, um, one of the questions that we received ahead of this webinar was um, how, how, how do you get your team to start quickly in games? Some teams will start slowly and, and get quicker as the game goes on, build momentum, or it might be the opposite where they start slowly and, you know, and or, you know, vice versa. So like, how, how would you do in a team meeting or approaching a game for your team to get going quickly? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question because I found actually at the finals last year, um, the other teams probably started the games maybe quicker and sharper than us. And I think it was a case that the other teams were going for the jugular with us straight away because so many of our players were so so much younger, uh, and they felt maybe here we we get at these things and maybe physically sometimes it can often be a physical battle that you lose that you're not mm-hmm. getting a. A grip on the game earlier, you feel your team's not starting because teams might get you into a physical battle if they think that they can maybe soften you up a wee bit, and um, that could be one way. But um, we've Colin Healy who does a great job with their players before before the the games, like you know, say just right after the the national anthems, Colin will take the Colin will take them in in the group and maybe do thirty or forty seconds short sharp runs with them, some dynamic work, and, and just in that short period and get them ready for them that first whistle goes and that first action that you know it's just a wee spark i think it's, it's useful and we also do that in the second half as well colin takes the players out that wee bit earlier than the opposition if they don't come out obviously and um he will he will do likewise with them and the uh, different runs the uh, uh, multi-directional stuff short sharp get into their heads get us going and uh, that can often be very beneficial and maybe a useful tool for a uh, Coaches out there that feel that their teams maybe don't start well, eh, may have to maybe motivate them a wee bit more too if you feel they're not starting right. <laughs> sure, yeah. Tom, can you can you talk about the importance of um the language of football, football language, you know, in in terms of maybe simplifying the communication? Yeah, like you know, it's all through you know our, our coach education again and that link that you know that obviously this modern football language UEFA are using and trying to get everybody on the same. Eh, line as such uh, the big ones now that we would use like, would be communication decision making execution like football fitness into that football actions and if you look at communication communication is always happening you know it can be verbal it can be non-verbal it could be communicating to see where your teammates are a uh, communication to see where the opposition are how they are set up so that that visual is of communication is always there uh, from that, obviously, it's you know there's a thought process that you've got to make decisions from that, and uh, that's two key key areas. Like you know, what you see, what decision do I make from this? You know, and then you're bringing in your execution, obviously your technique uh, to to execute your decision. And uh, some people can often say, "Oh, 
Oh, that's a player like, you know, he's so skillful and he's got unbelievable skill and how maybe did he not make it in the game? But you gotta look at that awareness, the the decision making, you can what execution, but if you can bring all together and then obviously your football fitness into the, the position, the specific position that you're gonna be playing and, and your football actions then. Uh, and um, obviously maintaining those throughout the game, like you know. That's where that fitness really comes in, and obviously the, the, the decision making, your, your brain sharp throughout the game as well. Like you know, and I have to say, the young players over the last number of years take all that, that information on board, and they're they're hungry for information because they've a hunger. Without that hunger and desire, you know, uh, you're going to really struggle to to be the best that you can be. Uh, so they would be the main ones that we would be looking at: communication, decision making, execution, football fitness, football actions. Uh, and then again, which I'll go back over uh, as a coach manager, always just being aware of the team shape, you know, regardless of what area of the pitch the action is. If you're attacking, you got your width, you got your depth, you want your wide players coming in, do you want your full full backs going forward? How many midfield players do you want to secure behind it? How secure are you with your, your other defenders behind it? Like, you know, so always looking at that team shape and then the specific units. That, that maybe your your target and work on, and then the individuals within that. So there's there's a sequence to to our coaching through um, uh, that link again, as I say, between our coach ed and, and our international department, and uh, getting all the latest trends and systems and information through UEFA. Uh, ultimately, Tom, there's a lot of trust you have to place in the players from taking all of this information on board in the various team meetings and instructions that. You're given throughout the week, all the way up to your, you know, pre-match team talk and Colin getting them ready just before kickoff. You have to place a lot of trust that they're going to take that on board and they're going to, as you say, implement the decision making um, in the game. You know, if you rewind back to the 2019 European Championships in Armenia, as you, as you alluded to, you know, if you say that you're starting a little bit slowly in games, you still have to trust the players that they're going to get it right. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Gareth. Like you know, you. And obviously, you gain that trust by players actually delivering performances. And uh, there are also leaders within the group too. And uh, there's, there's a big onus on those leaders that have that have got you know the experience to to relay messages on to maybe the players that may not be as experienced. Like you know, and I look back to last year and uh, you Brian Maher, who had great experience right through the the age of Oshie McIntyre. Like you know, these lads that. Played in a couple of under seventeen finals. Um, you, you Leo Connor, who's unbelievable number of caps. He must be cut off up on seventy or eighty under his international caps, like you know. Um, and obviously, you had Jonathan Afalabi up front. So, in spite of that, team actually, you could say a bang. These fellas, you know, they've been about. They know they can take on board the information. And I was not saying the other lads can't. The other lads, yeah, but they might have had to help the younger lads, say the under seventeens coming in. You know, mm. at various stages, but. You look at some of the under 17s that come into the under 19s because we've we've fluidity in our in our system that uh, Colin O'Brien and them lads at you know European finals in, in May prior to coming into us, uh, Joe Hodge, uh, Matty Everett, Festi Abusili, Andrew Mopumba Bamadile, and and they fitted in seamlessly, like you know. So I got that trust, obviously, go back to that word trust is very, very important, like you know, and uh, performances will will give you that answer and thankfully the boys you, you can trust them to, to to work hard and put the performances in and they delivered didn't they joe hodge caught an absolutely cracking goal on one stage and won a really crucial time in the game yeah he did you know and that's responsibility again like you know and understand that if you look at you know the goal and see the goal that joe and lee are backing it up from midfield obviously we're one down we're throwing bodies forward like you know but the the intelligence of the two players just at the edge of the box to pick up the bits and pieces be forced to react. And Joe's Joe's anticipated it and he's like his his this execution was was top top class like you know so yeah. Um you, it's kind of I suppose your sec your second finals European finals as a head coach you also uh, you got to obviously you got to the under nineteen to the semi finals last year and uh, you've also been in charge of the under seventeens um European championships. Well, you've also experienced the European Championships at other levels as well. You were with Sean McCaffrey as an assistant, and you've also been on a study trip as well. Yeah, and uh, 
2008, uh, the 1991 Bourne Group got to the finals, and actually it was a it was a fantastic achievement to get there because they uh, qualified. You know, in the elite phase, you had uh, Portugal and Germany in the group, like you know, and drew with Germany and beat Portugal. Had to beat Portugal with two clear goals in the last game, like you know. So, uh, and you know, Robbie Brady and Connor Hurlihan, you know, Greg Cunningham, lads like that there that were in that group, and um, Richie Tiles, another was in that group. Uh, Connor Clifford's another, you know, uh, so there was, uh, you know, Mark Connolly as well, Clonus Man, a better man, so a local man as well. Uh, and lads, you know, there was and they were a really, really good group. And that was my first real year with an international group. And uh, it was a big, big learning for me. Uh, and uh, yeah. But it was it was really, really good. Uh, Joe Boyle was the, was the coach on that with, with Sean as well. Dermot, you know, uh, was the goalkeeping coach. And... I learned so much in that period, like, you know, it, like it was, that was my first real introduction to international football and to get to a finals, it was it really topped it off. Uh, so that was a great experience. And it's great to see so many of those lads doing so well and still in the game and, you know, young uh, Aaron Doran's another one, like, you know, doing really, really well, you know, when he's had a very consistent career in Scotland. So uh, then we went to the 2015 finals with the under-17s, uh, Connor Masterson, Kevin Kelleher, um, Dara Leahy, JJ Lunny, that particular group of players. Uh, and we like we had a great experience at those things. Connor Ronan was another one who hit the bar in the last minute and it went down against the against the Dutch and it wasn't allowed. It was like uh, the, the goal in the 66 World Cup final, only England got it, we didn't get ours. But the great memories, like you know, and the, it's the, the brilliant they're the last with you, you know, a lifetime. And to have worked with those players, they were, they were brilliant. And it's great to see them progressing on and doing so well, going into 21s, some of them getting senior caps. You know, it's really, really pleasing from our aspect. But we can't never forget the work that's done below us as well. Like, you know, the, the grassroots, the people at the clubs, the, um, the, the pride those people have in developing these players and also developing their, their clubs and work. And, and only those structures are in place, you know, Maybe do the players may not be coming into us as well as advanced as they are and through our emerging talent program. So there's there, there's a pathway the whole way there for the players. And I know I'm getting off your, your point of finals and that, but it's very, very important that we get the message out that the appreciation we have that goes on on the ground is massive. And I know myself as a development officer and the work clubs are doing and putting facilities together and getting coaches in, getting coaches upskilled and We've, you know, for the progression of Irish football, and now with Stephen in charge of the senior team, uh, and you know, we've really, really got to work together, and we've got to, got to be very, very supportive of each other if we want the glory years back, like uh, the, the Jack Charlton years. You know, that's that's what it's about. We want those those great times back, and we went to a finals in 2017, and Bappy actually played, um, and Niall O'Regan brought a study group out uh, that in, included. Dermot O'Neill, Martin Doyle, uh, McNeville, myself, uh, Ray Claffey, and we've we done a lot of study on, on different opponents there, and we brought you know the various learnings from that back to coach education as well. So that was that was brilliant, and we, we had to put a team together, you know, and we all had a compiler team, but we all had Mbappé in our team, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, we identified that talent. Uh, I think it was easy enough on that one. But it was a great experience and probably added to the hunger of really wanting to get to, to uh, an under-19 finals. This is a fantastic point to make, Tom, about the, the link between grassroots and elite football because some people can think it's insurmountable and it's too it's too large of a gap. But it's actually, it's it's something that really needs to be worked on, as you said, because because of uh, we are educating players, but we're also educating coaches. And that's the whole point of this webinar is that coaches of all levels can take on the points that you, yourself is making, you know, and, and implement them at their respective levels. Yeah, without without a doubt, Gareth. Like, you know, I think that's why, you know, these webinars are important, you know, to, to get that message out and all our, our, our coach education, that it's aligned with the ages, it's part of our player development uh, pathway as well and that everything's interconnected um, and that... We give coaches, there's that pathway for coaches as well, which is so important. Like, you know, it's not just a player pathway, there's a coach pathway there as well. Um, I think Stephen's a prime example of, you know, a coach in Ireland that has come right through 
the ranks and with great success and got to the top job in Irish football now, like you know, so yeah, I think it's a it's a great time for coaches in Ireland. And I see myself and I'll be we'll be over at UF and we'll be over in other countries at events. And um, our coaches are really, really good, like you know, and as good as there is out there in Europe. You know, obviously we don't have the professional leagues that other countries have, and that's what we've got to strive for. Uh, and I know it's a big aim from for the FAI as well to you know that, that our league is of, of great significance and that we improve it all the time. And I think that's it's massive that we 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 have that for our coaches as well and those opportunities. And for our coaches also getting great opportunities with their under age national league teams, right from under 13s the whole way up. And obviously in league squads as well, going to tournaments and uh, it gives uh, coaches great experience. And and I've come across that come through that path with myself where. Uh, I was a coach, you know, development officer in the northeast, uh, and then uh, further development officers come in. So it left me, you know, working in Cavan and um, got to work with some great people in school by football right throughout the northeast. And then I got involved in the emerging talent program with leagues and uh, and more specifically, obviously, then with the the, the Cavan and underage league and my time as development officer with Cavan. And those opportunities give me a great chance too. And there are many great young players that I got to work with, like, you know, young Jake Doyle Hayes and Johnny Letty, Ryan O'Reilly, lads that went on to, to gain international recognition, Oshie McIntyre and the coaches that were working within the Cavan and area. And I'm only giving that as an example that, you know, it's a great reward for them too to work with those players. And it's, it's open doors and it's an opportunity. Tom, can I just touch on um, team meetings again a little bit? Um, one of the things I was curious about was the staff and how you delegate the staff during the team meetings as well. You know, do you are there certain meetings where you take a step back and you won't talk in a meeting, or will you always have something to maybe top and tail a meeting? And are there are there specific sections where staff members are more more useful? Uh, yeah, there, you know, there's there's definitely if <laughs> you're chatting to Mick Nevely, probably say that I will not shut up and not give him a chance to talk to <laughs> me, you know. But um I, you, you do, you know, like for example, you, you're going back to your to your units again, like you know, and you're looking at information coming, you know, from the goalkeeper's perspective from Dermot O'Neill, like you know, who's had a phenomenal career in the League of Ireland, he's got vast experience in coaching in League of Ireland clubs and international level as well. So, you know, Dermot will give points, you know, to the keepers, but also uh, give points maybe on the build up or an open play when when it's in and around our defensive area. Like you know that there's that freedom for coaches to come in. Like Mix, one of the most probably decorated players ever in League of Ireland history and one of the best centre backs, you know, to, to play in the League of Ireland. So you you have players like, you know, our centre backs Oshin and and Mark McGuinness, uh, Nathan Collins, Connor Masters Masters and to name but a few. It's great for Mick to, you know, give some of his experiences back to those players also. And Colin Healy, Colin Healy was a phenomenal midfield player. Like, you know, he played with with a Celtic team that included Henrik Larson, Neil Lennon, Stillian Petroff, players that got there. And he 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 played numerous times for that Celtic team. Like, you know, and that's the calibre of people that we have, you know, as technical staff. Obviously, we go back to the finals, we had from the analysis, we had Mark Scanlon in, Mickey Feeney, Martin Doyle, um, Really, really intelligent football people and great knowledge and a uh, great skill set to deliver good presentations. Uh, and I go back again to our to to the downtime of the players too, Gareth. Like you know, yeah. it's probably everybody's thinking it's not about team meetings, but I'm only giving a, a snippet of our team meetings, and we, we try yeah. not that the duration doesn't go on too long on the team meetings that it, it bores the life out of players, but. There's down, downtime for the players, like you know, and we've Mickey Midland as a monsieur, and during that downtime, players can go into Mickey, have a chat, um, and uh, you know, get them refreshed, recovered for their next game. Uh, you've got the kit room, uh, John Crudden's our, our, our kit manager, and uh, John, the, the, the kit room will always be open. It's a nice, relaxed environment. There'll be a dartboard in there, fellas can go and play with the darts, they can go and listen to music. Uh, so the importance of the staff play, you know, with that interaction with players and, and our medical staff as well. Mick Spillane has obviously stepped on now and, you know, he's retired from his role as, as a physio with their international teams. Um, he's a great man with players and, you know, a great knowledgeable man. And even with their study and things like that, the likes of Mick and Andrew Delaney, who's a football man also, these people would help the players on maybe their education side of things too. 
uh, education from academic point of view, but also life education, like you know, and mm -hmm. it's very, very important that bond between staff and players is strong and that the bottom line is we're there to help players, you know, uh, it's about the players, the game's about the players, and we gotta be, even as coaches, we gotta be careful that, you know, we don't become too overpowered or it's all about us. Uh, Sometimes the less you hear from coaches and the less I've seen of coaches, <laughs> I feel sometimes the better. Uh, you have to obviously do your duties, you do your media work, but the game is about players and it's about it's our duty to provide these players with tools to help them be better, better people and better players and give them a chance to, you know, to fulfil their dreams. And do you think that that exactly what you've said there that relates to your ethos to? Your approach to team meetings. Yeah, absolutely. Like you know, this um, that how can we make the players better? You know, what can we do? Yes, we've got to learn more. We've got to get more information on board. We've got to work hard. Uh, we've got to have the knowledge and impart our knowledge to the players in various different ways. Yes, through team meetings. Some players may not take it on board in team meetings. Mm -hmm. It may be unit discussion within the team meeting could be more could be better for them. Individual meetings could be one of the best ways of getting information. And I actually feel the the individual meetings, the timing of those is important too. I, I like to do them match day minus one, uh, to give a player an understanding of well, you're you're going to be playing. This is the role that you're going to be playing, or maybe it could be the hard. The hard message, which it's always nice delivering good news, but you've got to deliver the bad news too. I'm sorry you're not playing and you've got to give them the reasons they're not playing. And uh, you can see the reaction of players. It's a, it's a serious disappointment. And, and that's, you know, the things. But always try and provide reason uh, to the players as to why they're doing something, why they're starting, what they're going to do, and those that may not be starting. Uh, and they're so important because the players that are on the bench that aren't playing, as much as the other ones, uh, they can sink the ship. Often happens, some of the greatest teams in the world, some of the greatest countries that have gone to World Cups as raging hot favourites, and the, the harmony wasn't right within the group. Uh, Tom, that's uh, it's been brilliant stuff. Really, really, really insightful and uh, great, great to get such a wide range of um, how impactful a team meeting can be um, and obviously uh, your own experiences as well. You've set an assignment for any coaches watching this. Um, can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, obviously the the, the CPD, uh, the 3R CPD, uh, now like the coaches uh, to go and, and, and obviously take note of the, the points that we're, we're after going through and uh, put an assignment together on uh, how they would deliver pre and post training meetings, pre and post uh, match meetings, individual meetings within their own settings at their own clubs and obviously uh, with a view to your own team. Uh, so enjoy that. Uh, I hope you get something from it and uh, all the best to everybody and please God we get back in action soon. Yeah, we'll have to slide up now as we're talking about this. Um, and if you could email your assignments to tom.moan at uh, by 11 o'clock on Wednesday, the 20th of uh, of May. And uh, we'll see how we get on with that. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Thanks very much to you for tuning in. And uh, uh, hopefully we can get more information now in webinars going forward. Thanks very much. Thanks, Gareth.